Amanda is the Sullivan and Cromwell Strategic Litigation Council at Public Council, the nation's largest provider of pro bono legal services. And as a leader of Public Council's impact litigation projects, Amanda works with movement organizers to build cases that push the law toward racial equity. So please join me in welcoming Amanda. Check, 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 check. Yeah, her, her lab is on. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your patience. Um, and thank you um, for letting me be in this space with you today. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be here, and I am very grateful to Catalyst for creating this space for this conversation. Um, so today, I'm here to talk about Kayla J versus the state of California, which is a lawsuit that was brought in 2020 to remedy the attempt to remedy the racial disparities and the wealth disparities that we saw exacerbated um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. But I'd like to use this time also to talk a little bit about the role of litigation in this space, um, and particularly affirmative litigation, so offensive litigation to further racial equity. Okay, um, I was really moved by all of the presentations yesterday, um, especially when presenters spoke about their why and where they were coming from. So uh, although attorneys aren't usually known for shows of vulnerability, I wanted to introduce you to my family. Um, so the photo, the black and white photo, is my father's family. Um, my dad is the one in the middle. Um, it was taken in the Philippines in the 1960s. Um, but I actually wanted to talk about my grandfather, um, my Lolo Cleto, um, as I knew him growing up. Um, so Anacleto was the son of farmers in the Ilocos region um, of the island of Luzon in the Philippines. And he became a lawyer um, with the help of his sisters, all of whom were teachers. He was the seventh of 10 children. Um, and he instilled in me from very young a sense of the importance of education, primarily, I think, in his view, as a means for accessing the institutions that distribute economic power in our society um, as a means of achieving financial stability. Um, and that was, that was kind of my first introduction to the importance of education. Um, but I want to fast forward to today. Um, so that's my dad there again um, with my son, Mark. Um, he's 20 months old. Um, and he was the person, for those of you who were here yesterday, that I was thinking about bringing on the boat with me. Um, and I included a picture of him because while I do think that education remains one of the most important vehicles, right, for opening up institutions economically and leveling the, the wealth gaps in this country, I also think that it serves a very foundational, and for me, what has become um, an equally paramount role, which is as the foundation of a vibrant multiracial democracy. And so when I envision um, the, the world that my son and children like him um, will grow up into, I, I want it to be a space of joy. I want it to be a space of equity. And right now he's 20 months old, he has no idea of the types of contests 
that are going on over the public schools, over how he will learn about how the world works, what our history is, his place in it. Um, and I want to acknowledge that we're coming from a relatively privileged position, to say nothing of, you know, black joy, as I know that Dr. Love, who's been an expert in so many of our cases, always talks about. But I want that joy for all children. So thank you for bearing with me. OK. Um, so I wanted to talk about our partners in this work. Um, and I want to start with our partners in Kayla J. But I just want to shout out that all of the litigation that we bring is driven by movement organizers, is driven by community groups. Um, and so I see Miguel, um, whom I first met while working on this second case here, Smith versus, versus Regents of the University of California, which eliminated the SAT and the ACT at the University of California because it's discriminatory on the basis of wealth, on the basis of race, and on the basis of disability. But we couldn't do this without our partners bringing this to our attention and leading the way, leading the strategy. And so I see litigation as a lever in a movement that we are all a part of. Um, and I, one of the reasons for this presentation is I wanna encourage you all to see litigation as a lever that you can utilize as well when other policy levers fail. Um, so we worked with Community Coalition in the Oakland Reach in the Kayla J case. The reason we worked with these groups was because they came to us and they said, we are fulfilling the functions of the school system. We are the ones that are in our constituents and communities' homes, teaching them how to access remote learning. We are the ones that are giving them laptops when they haven't gotten laptops from their schools or from the state. We are the ones that are ensuring that they show up in the virtual classroom, that they have access to the virtual classroom, right, which was not a given during the pandemic for so many of our students. Um, so they are the ones that really brought about Kayla J. Um, I mentioned Smith versus Regents of the University of California. Um, and then the last case that I, I would just like to highlight here, even though it's not the topic of this talk, is I think apropos of all of the conversations we've been having, especially the panel led yesterday by Dr. Cohn, um, and I think really lit up by Brooklyn Anderson, um, is that we have a case, May M versus Komorowski, which challenges Temecula's quote unquote critical race theory ban, which challenges Temecula's forced outing policy. And it challenges those policies on the basis of the rights that are guaranteed to students under the California Constitution. Um, and the goal of that case and the goal of all of our cases is to change the conversation so that it's not about policy choices, it's not about you know, necessarily democratic decision making if that's going to overrun the rights that are enshrined in the California Constitution, which are extraordinarily robust. So let me transition. So these are the causes of action that we brought in the Kayla J case. We alleged that the failure right, of the state to um, ensure that all students had equal access to the remote classroom violated their rights under the Equal Protection Clause of the California Constitution. We brought race discrimination claims, we brought wealth discrimination claims, and we brought, we brought a basic educational equity claim. And one thing that um, a lot of folks do not know is that there is well, probably none of the folks in this room, but members of the general public do not know that there is no right, right at the federal level to education. California is very different. California has a fundamental right to education and a robust jurisprudence around the fundamental right to education. And that means that we can leverage our state constitution, even in a hostile, right, national environment, to secure rights and to fight back affirmatively against the folks that would take those rights away. Um, I close here with um, a quote from Butt versus State of California, um, which is really the seminal case in California education jurisprudence. It's the case that guarantees all students um, a right to basic educational equity. And what it just highlights is that the state is really the ultimate bearer of responsibility for public education. So notwithstanding local control, right, it can't be delegated away. They're the backstop, right? They have to ensure 
that our educational system is equitable. And when they fail to do so, intentionally or not, we have the right to litigate, we have the right to enforce those rights. So the settlement. This is a settlement that we reached with the administration. Um, and I want to just go briefly through these terms because I know that Joe went through them yesterday. But essentially it, it hinges on two key points. First is the passage of a law that basically addresses agreed upon criteria, which I will go through subsequently. Um, and the law itself will be um, part of the omnibus um, education trailer bill. I, I think I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a policy person, so I may be saying that wrong. But um, it's, it's basically part of the budget cycle. And the second piece of it is we've agreed with the administration that unless at least $2 billion are dedicated to this purpose, um, we can reopen the case notwithstanding budget shortfalls. Okay, so what are the key features of the settlement? Um, and I know that Joe went over this yesterday, so I, I won't spend too much time. Um, but needs-based assessments, basically, the $2 billion are funds that have already been allocated but not encumbered, right? So I want to I, I wanna make clear that these are existing funds, and what the settlement does is it's placing restrictions on those funds to ensure that they are better able to reach the students who were shut out of the remote classroom, our black and brown students, our low-income students. Um, so we're requiring a needs-based assessment, a robust needs-based assessment that the state um, has articulated a, a commitment to help local districts with one of the, I think, reasonable concerns right, about any new settlement like this is, is this going to create more paperwork for districts? That's, that's not the goal. Um, and we have commitment from the state to issue guidance, to um, provide assistance to districts in, in conducting all of the elements of this settlement. So the second piece, which I think is, you know, one that came up yesterday, is we're amending the education code to incorporate the evidence-based standard applicable to federal funds. So for those of you who are familiar with the tiers, right, of, of evidence-based um, from ESSER, that, that's what we're talking about here. And, and I will note that it includes tier four which I think is really important and, sp and speaks to one of the questions that was raised yesterday, which is how is a community-based organization supposed to get right, a study, a rigorous study, um, in the time that we're contemplating that, that their methods work? And we know that they work, right? It's, I mean, it's common sense that they work. Um, and I think that the fact that tier four is included within this um, is, is really critical and will we'll, we'll keep community groups from, from being locked out of this. And that, that kind of segues to the next, excuse me, feature of the settlement. Um, oh, well actually, sorry. So the evidence-based standards, they, they need to be articulated within the local control and accountability plans, right? So the, the rationales need to be within there and that is also the mechanism by which we are seeking to ensure accountability. Okay, so next, funds for community organizations. Um, this was one of the, the pieces of the settlement that we are most proud of. Um, Basically, it provides that community-based organizations um, can be brought in to the school system where, you know, historically, sometimes they've been relegated to the outside of that. Um, and we're going to encourage LEAs to um, contract with and partner with community-based organizations because we know from the pandemic that they're the ones that know how to do this work. Um, and that they can, they can do this work in a way that enriches and supplements and supports our educators in the schools. Um, and so I think this is one of the most exciting parts of this. Um, and I just want to emphasize that the evidence-based standard is not meant to drive out community organizations. And, and the goal, actually, is that with the, um, with the analyses and the evaluations and the assessments that come after the settlement, um, we will be also giving community organizations um, a set of data, right, a robust set of data, maybe that they hadn't had access to before necessarily or hadn't had the resources to collect um, that they can then leverage to, you know, further their influence and further their programs. So that's a goal. Uh, the last thing I would just want to highlight, <laughs> excuse me, um, is the uniform complaint procedure and the expansion of standing 
to bring a uniform complaint. Um, and I think that this is a really notable feature of the settlement. Um, so LCAPs have always been subject to the uniform complaint procedure, right? When we think that a school district is falling short of what it is committed to in its LCAP, um, we, and by we I mean students, parents have had the right to file a complaint. Um, but what this will do is it will codify that an interested party, excuse me, um, that an interested party is any member of the public, and that could be an organization, right? So I think that one of the problems with the uniform complaint procedure previously was that it put the burden of filing a complaint on the people who are least resourced um, and least able to do that, right? Um, it's, I think, unreasonable to ask working parents, to ask people who are, you know, just trying to make ends meet, to go through this, I mean, really technical process. Um, and I think that this will be a space where organizations, um, nonprofits, um, groups like us can come in and ensure that commitments made to these students are actually followed. Okay, um, I think I'm within the time. Um, so this is a QR code that will connect you to our case website, which has, excuse me, um, the complaint, the settlement, um, just some more information. Um, and, and I guess the only thing that I will say is that I'm not sure that I have all of the answers. Um, the settlement is written in broad strokes, as settlements often are, um, and the statutory language is equally broad. Um, I think we anticipate that there will be further clarification. Um, but all that being said, I, I hope that you'll be willing to reach out directly if you have any questions, um, which we will do our best to answer. And I've also included the email of Chelsea Kerr, um, because Morrison and Forster was our really critical um, pro bono partner in this effort, and she is very well aware of the contours of the settlement as well. So please feel free to reach out to either of us. Please do read the settlement. Um, it's a little dry, but please do read it, and um, I'll turn it back today. Thank you so much for allowing me this time to present to you.